Now I get to someone who literally needs no introduction. Lynn Sher is a multimedia task force. She has been an award-winning television correspondent, producer, editor, and anchor. Her assignments have ranged from investigative reports, politics and elections, space flights, and a range of issues involving women's lives, to which she brings a thorough and incisive spotlight. Lynn is also a regular radio co-host, an author of books we should all have on our shelves, including Susan B. Anthony's Slept Here and Failure is Impossible, Susan B. Anthony in her own words. She is a regular contributor to the Daily Beast website, a contributing editor to Moore Magazine. No wonder she titled her memoir, Outside the Box. Outside, indeed. Throughout her career, Lynn has been a trailblazer and a role model, leading the way in opening new roles for women, setting an example of grace and determination. Lynn Sher doesn't just report history, she makes it. And JWA is so proud to present our Living the Legacy Award to Lynn Sher. about the jacket today, so I knew what color to wear. Uh, thank you, Anne, so very much. Thank you to all of you. It's such a joy to be here, and I am truly honored to be in the company of my sister honorees, uh, Ruth Abram, who runs one of the best museums in the country, if not in the world. Um, I think of the ten Tenement House is the house that we all probably grew up in if you just skipped a generation or two. So what an amazing place. And Kate, um, what a joy to hear your truly eloquent words. And I, I kind of breathed a sigh of relief after we spoke because I thought, okay, we're safe with the next generation. So thank you for all of that. Thank you also to my personal fan base at my table for all being here and for showing up. And um, I must mention one of um, one of the guests at my table, uh, Bonnie Roche Bronfman, just to continue the triangle uh, story for a minute. Bonnie has done the sets for a really, I've seen the rehearsals, a really wonderful dramatic oratorio written by Liz Suedos, the immensely talented Liz Suedos. Uh, it's being performed at the Judson Memorial Church uh, March 23rd through the 27th. Bonnie, raise your hand if you want. You can you can find it online. It's called From the Fire. Bonnie can give you more information. Um, it's it's going to be truly amazing. So I recommend it. I'll be there. I will be there. Um, and thanks also to my pal Nikki Tanner, about whom the best thing and the only thing I can say is that when Nikki asks you to do something without even hearing what it is, the answer is yes. So to the wonderful Nikki Tanner. what we're all here for today um, may best be grabbed in a story I like to tell. And this is a story about the 65-year-old uh, woman who, with the help of a fertility specialist, had a baby. So she has this miracle baby, and everybody's quite excited about it. And all of her relatives come to visit. They want to see the new baby. And when they ask to see the baby, the 65-year-old mother says, well, wait a minute, not yet. And they said, why not? And she said, well, the baby's sleeping. And they said, fine. And they hung around for a little bit. An hour later, they said, come on, we really want to see the baby. She said, no, no, you can't get the baby still sleeping. And they said, okay, fine. Another hour goes by. And finally, they said, why in the world do we have to wait until the baby wakes up to see it? And the 65-year-old mother said, because I forgot where I put it. <laughs> What JWA is doing is making sure we don't forget anything. <laughs> the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire is a symbol of the way women used to be invisible. Until, of course, something horrific happened to them and catapulted an ordinary life into the national pantheon. 
I think uh, because of the work that she did in getting what finally happened into laws, uh, legislation, so that reforms were in fact out there, I think we should make Frances Perkins an honorary Jewish woman. <laughs> When I wrote my first book about uh, landmarks in American women's history, my co-author and I uh, wrote letters, made telephone calls, sent postcards, this was the dark ages, it was 1975, uh, to historical sites all over the country. We would ask, do you have any monuments or memorials commemorating women? The answers were all the same. Why would we do that? I am not making this up. I first learned about and wrote about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire back then, and to be honest, I had a hard time finding the site of the building. It was only in 1961 that a plaque was finally put up there by the ILGWU, and it was only designated a New York City landmark in 2002. Now, of course, it's a National Historic Landmark, um, and therefore it is not only in our history, it is in our hearts, and everybody can see it at this point. That JWA would commemorate Triangle is simply justice. I say this not only because the women who died there might, might, have been my ancestors, but because they stand as a reminder of the deaths that had to take place before real reform came into being. Triangle, of course, is just one story. There are so very many stories. Stories I have tried to tell in all of my books and in all of my reporting. What makes me happy about the Jewish Women's Archive is that so many more stories will now be told about the women who were marginalized as they lived, but who inspire us now that we know all the facts. What makes me very sad is that I never got the full story of my, two, of my own forebears, two extraordinary grandmothers who did something that I now find unimaginable. As children, or perhaps as teenagers, they left the only homes they had ever known to travel to a new land to start a new life. Lucky for me and for my sister, they did it and they did it very well. But under what circumstances and with what sacrifices, we'll never know. If only JWA had been around them. We are living in a time of breathtaking change. The texture of our lives has been shorthanded mercilessly. Novels have been reduced to tweets relationships to speed dating, tragedy to brief headlines in the evening news. But real stories take time to tell, and they need an archivist to preserve them, whether it's online or between hardcovers or even just burned onto a disc. And no story is less important than another story. Decades from now, or maybe even centuries, whether in this galaxy or even in another, the stories that JWA is preserving will form the basis of another generation's, or perhaps another species, understanding of who and what we are and were. How much better does it get than that? A number of years ago, at the beginning of my journalism career, I was invited to speak at the synagogue outside of Philadelphia where I grew up. Someone in the audience asked whether my background had influenced my choice of career, since Jews are always asking questions and then answering with another question. I asked if he was serious. <laughs> In fact, I became a reporter for a very corny reason, to tell the truth, to go behind the curtain and expose the wizardry, to find out why and when and where, to help make sense and thus bring order to a distinctly disordered world. I don't know for sure that there is a wonder gene, but I'm convinced that I have it because curiosity is the prime requisite for any journalist, and I am forever grateful to my parents for giving me that gene. Although I make no, no, no excuses for occasional lapses that I ran into in the world of television journalism, a year or so into my first job uh, on television, which was here in New York at WCBS Channel 2, I was in the newsroom one afternoon, a very quiet Saturday, having a lively discussion with some of my colleagues. Uh, this was back in the early 70s. We were talking about the most recent Arab-Israeli conflict, the one that was known as the Yom Kippur War. And at one point, a Channel 2 executive, one of the suits, wandered over to join the conversation. I don't remember anything we talked about, except as the conversation ended, we all went back to our desks. 
Uh, we started drifting apart, and he punctuated our chat with a very cheery toda raba. Instinctively, I responded, bavak Shah. The guy in the suit stopped in his tracks, shook his head, and looked at me accusingly. What did you say, he said? I said, I said, bavak Shah. And he said, why did you say that? I said, because you said toda raba, which means thank you in Hebrew, and I answered bavak Shah, which means you're welcome. And he said, well, how did you know how to say that? <laughs> So I said, a lot of years of Hebrew school. <laughs> Hebrew school, he said. But you're blonde. <laughs> you went to Wellesley. You're from Philadelphia, the main line. You can't be Jewish. I am, I was, etc. Perhaps now you understand some of the problems of television news a little bit better. At least that's how it used to be. Yes, everything has changed today, and no, not always for the better. But preserving all of those changes without bias is what good journalists do. And now it is what the Jewish Women's Archive is doing to remind the next generations of the wonder that is our world. So thank you to the Jewish Women's Organization. Thanks to all of you. And one more story in the spirit of this very energized room. This one takes place in a synagogue. It's at the end of Shabbat services. And the rabbi says from the pulpit, so how many of you have forgiven your enemies? Everyone holds up their hands except for one very small, very elderly woman. Mrs. Goldstein, says the rabbi, are you not willing to forgive your enemies? Well, I don't have any, she says, smiling sweetly. Mrs. Goldstein, says the rabbi, that's impossible. How old are you? Ninety-eight, she says. Mrs. Goldberg, won't you please come up to the pulpit and tell us all how you can live 98 years and not have an enemy in the world. Mrs. Goldstein totters up to the, uh, the, the bima. She stands up, she faces the conversation, the, conserva the, con <laughs> the congregation, and she says in a very strong voice, I outlived the bitches. <laughs> I suggest that you outlive them all, remember them all, and keep those stories coming. Thank you very much.